The Department of Environment and Natural Resources orders the relief of the top officials of the Mines and Geosciences Bureau, Region 7, as death toll in the landslide hit. Landslide hit the city of Naga, Cebu, rises to 22. Gladys Tawabi tells us why. Environment and Natural Resources Secretary Roy Simato orders the relief of the top executives of the Mines and Geosciences Bureau in the province of Cebu following a landslide that struck a city in Tinaan village in Naga City. Simato also orders the creation of a team tasked to investigate the incident and the possible liability of the said officials. I have created a team composed of technical personnel from the Mines and Geosciences Bureau and the Environment Management Bureau to conduct an investigation to determine the cause of the landslide incident. And also, their mission also is to conduct the reassessment of the jail hazard in Barangay Tinaan and the surrounding areas of Naga City in Cebu. The DNR also orders a 15-day suspension and pouring activities in the country, particularly in the regions 1, 3, 5, 10, 11, and 13, as well as in Calabarzon and Cebu. They remain suspended until such time that the review and assessment are completed of the quarry operations areas, especially the surrounding communities as far as safety is concerned from the impact of quarry operations and J.U. Hazard. As of today, the death toll has climbed to 22 and authorities fear it will rise up further as a search operation continues for the still missing 60 others. Earlier reports said the eroded soil from the site of the mountain pressed and buried around 27 homes, with residents still trapped inside. Naga City Mayor Christine Chong also discloses that prior to the incident, residents have reported of fissures in the mountain, prompting them to issue an order for the Apple Land and Quarry Corporation to cease their operation in the area. Show DNR MGB documents dated August 29, but the result of the inspection conducted by the DNR Mines and Geosciences Bureau stated that the fissures were caused by a natural phenomenon and not by quarry operations. The local authorities then withdraw the cease and desist order under the condition that they will monitor the area and ensure the residents' safety. Mayor Chong adds they also conducted reassessment and preemptive evacuation when they received another report on growing fissures in the area. However, some residents refused to leave their homes. The Apple Land and Quarry Corporation has earlier denied conducting quarry operations in the mountain, insisting that they are only developing the site. We actually don't have um, plans no, of uh, quarrying, uh, not this year, not even next year. It's not part of our uh, what we call our mining development plan. No? Although we have what we call our mining rights uh, in the area. Despite this, the company has vowed to provide 30,000 pesos for each affected families. The city government of Naga has also ordered a forced evacuation for people living one kilometer away from the ground zero. More than 2,000 individuals are currently staying in established evacuation centers. Gladys Tuabi, UNTV News and Rescue, Cebu. The Office of the Civil Defense orders a forced evacuation in Barangay Ukab, Togon, Benguet, amid ongoing search for the missing landslide victims. Nel Maribohok tells us why. Authorities ordered a forced evacuation of Ground Zero in Barangay Ukab in the municipality of Itogon due to potential landslides as rains begin to drench the already muddy slope. On Friday, the emergency team was able to bring down heavy equipment and additional canine units to speed up the rescue and retrieval operations. However, rescuers and volunteers were ordered to immediately vacate the site as recommended by the Mines and Geosciences Bureau to limit the number of people in the area in view of another landslide due to continuous downpour. We will advise them to get out. Natuto na tayo, diba? Kaya nga nagkaroon ng ganito eh. Na hindi nga sila nakikinig sa advice eh. But now, uh, mayroon nang sabi ng EJB na active yung mga landslide na nakapaligid sa atin. So, only the authorized number of people na sinabi ko ng mga 30. At siyempre, mayroong PNP rito na babantay na wala makakapasok na dito. The local government will order a forced evacuation of residents in surrounding areas of Ground Zero and only miners as well as workers of volunteer mining companies will be allowed on site. 
bukas din to, tuloy mi din. May iwan kami dito. Sanay na din. Wala namang pumunta dito sa may kampo-kampo namin na nagsabi na aalis na kayo kasi ganito, ganito. Doon kami sa taas. Doon kami sa mga kamag-anak namin doon sa, no, sa taas. Doon kami titira ngayon. Heavy equipment such as these four backhoes will remain on the ground to fast-track the excavation works. As of today, authorities were able to recover 29 bodies from the landslide areas while 40 more persons remain missing. Nel Maribuho, UNTV News and Rescue, Itogon Benguet. Benguet farmers and traders report a slump in vegetable prices following road clearing operations in the Cordillera region. Rosalie Cos explains why. The prices of highland vegetables have returned to normal after roads were reopened, giving opportunities for Benguet farmers and traders to reach the vegetable trading posts in La Trinidad. According to Agot Balanoy, spokesperson for the League of Association in La Trinidad Vegetable Trading Post, current wholesale vegetable prices have stabilized compared to last week when there was hardly any supply of vegetables due to closed roads. Local authorities have reported road closures around the Cordillera region due to landslide incidents during the course of Typhoon Ompong. From 200 to 350 pesos per kilogram, Cabbage are now sold at 70 to 90 pesos, carrots at 50 to 100 pesos, Chinese cabbage at 35 to 65 pesos, and potatoes at 40 to 47 pesos a kilogram. Balanoy adds that the 100 to 150 percent decrease in prices will also be reflected in prices in Metro Manila when vegetable traders will replenish their supply in the coming days. The cooperative official also says that Benguet farmers suffered huge losses during the onslaught of Typhoon Ompong with a reduced vegetable production. Eh, sa percentage kasi ng recovery o yung pagre-rehab nila, siguro yung mga harvestable uh, for um, October, November, 40% lang ang makaka-survive talaga. At uh, saka sa siguro yung for December and January, at least mas malaki yung chances nila na makasurvive, at least 70% yung chances ng survival nila. Balanoy also discloses that farmers will need cash assistance to rehabilitate their farms that produce cruciferous vegetables. And they can only do that. Mahahabol nila yung pagrehab sa farm nila in a very fast pace kung matutulungan sila Number one, sa manpower, sa labor. Paano natin sila tutulungan sa manpower and labor? Uh, for one, mechanization. She also appeals to the government to extend more financial and mechanization support for Benguet farmers to help them recover from huge losses in order to meet demand for vegetables. Siguro pwedeng i-augment yung mga market sa baba kasi sila yung mga, siguro may mga arena na hindi nakakaabot yung mga temperate vegetables. We hope we will not also forsake and forget the farmers of Cordillera na nabagyo rin. Kasi yung mga farmer ng Cordillera, nagkapital din ang mga yan. Inutang din nila yung mga capitalization. Tapos biglang sinira lang ng monsoon tsaka yung typhoon umpong. Eh, Siyempre saan na sila kukuha ng, uh, ng pangrehab uli nila. Rosa Licoz, UNTV News and Rescue. Over 20 villages in Bulacan remain submerged in flood waters nearly a week after Typhoon Umpong pounded parts of the country. Residents are also appealing for assistance from the government amid risks brought by the flooding. Here's why from Charlie Barredo. It's been nearly a week since Typhoon Umpong wreaked havoc in the country with its rains and hurricane force winds. The typhoon tore through much of northern Luzon, leaving a trail of destruction and forcing several dams to release water after rains filled it to spilling levels. Though Ompong did not directly hit Bulacan, parts of it were still inundated as the province serves as catch basin for waters that rush from nearby areas like Nueva Ecija. Until now, 28 villages in Kalumpit and Hagonoy towns remain swamped. Residents here have expressed worry of possibly contracting water and mosquito-borne illnesses. Delikado ang leptos. Aala ring magawa dahil na sa paghahatid ng mga estudyante, obligadong lumusong. Mahirap po. Lagi po kaming lubog eh. Ilang buwan na rin po kaming binabahari ito eh. 
Yung ibang gamit po, eh, binahana. Hindi po namin na iakit. Runoff waters also led to rivers in Bulacan to burst their banks, submerging farmlands and fish ponds. Fish pond owner Serafine Carpio has been thinking of ways on how to recuperate from huge losses after floodwaters damaged his three-hectare wide fish pond. Ito yung flash dahil ito, kahuhulog pa lang. Sa amin hong gantong malilit na mga flash dahil lahat dito, napakahirap at inaagaw lang namin yung puhuna namin eh. Updated report from the Provincial Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Council shows that damages to agriculture and fishing sector from Typhoon Ompong has reached nearly 60 million pesos. Bulacan residents are hoping that the government will extend livelihood assistance to recover from the devastation. Charlie Barreto, UNTV News and Rescue, Philippines. The Department of Agriculture revives its Tienda Farmers and Fisher Folks outlet in Manila amid rising consumer prices. Robby de Guzman explains why. Consumers flock to the compound of the Bureau of Plant Industry in Malate, Manila in time for the reopening of the Tienda Malasakit store this morning. The Department of Agriculture opened the Tienda Malasakit store or Tienda Farmers and Fisher Fox outlet to offer consumers an option to purchase agricultural products at a lower price amid the country's surging inflation. Consumers may buy here various kinds of fruits, vegetables and meat that were transported from the Talakag town of Bukidnon in Mindanao. Prices of producers here are 50% lower than in public markets. Agriculture Secretary Manny Pinol says this outlet will augment supplies in the national capital region as northern and central Luzon try to recuperate from the devastation wrought by Typhoon Ampong. We wanted to prove a point na yung presyuhan sa mercado is not indicative of a lack of supply. Kaya yung sinasabi na na uh, nag-inflation yung uh, gulay, uh, dapat mag-import. No, there's no need to import. We have a lot of vegetables. Pinyol says, agri-products from Mindanao will be made available weekly in the outlet. The Tienda Malasakit store is open during Fridays and Saturdays at 7 in the morning. Maganda, maganda, mura. <laughs> Kasi sa palengke, mahal ang kamatis, 70, 80. Yung sibuyas nila mura din, 50 hectang kilo. E sa palengke, 100. The agency targets to open more Malasakit stores in Metro Manila in the coming months. Robbie de Guzman, UNTV News and Rescue. The long wait is over for the selection of a third telco player in the country. Here's Monokson to tell us why. No more waiting game. After addressing legal and technical issues, the Department of Information and Communications Technology and other lead agencies have released the final memorandum circular on the rules and regulations on the selection process for the new major telco player in the Philippines. The MC will be effective 15 days after its publication on major broadsheets. After this, interested parties can get the bidding documents and submit it not later than November 5. The selection process will be based on the highest committed level of service or h clause method. Applicants will be scored through a point system based on their commitment. 40% for the coverage, 25% for internet speed, and 35% on their financial commitment. Ang ginag ginagawa natin is um, uh, trying to have a, a third telco that will increase the standard of our ICT, of our telecommunication. The third telco will be named in November. The third telco will be given 90 days to form different organizations inside their company. After this, they will be given license and franchise to operate. But the selection process will not end here, because if the new telco will fail to deliver, the DICT has the power to give it to others. If they cannot... Um uh, satisfy within six months, Baba win and our performance band, and including frequencies, no? so that we can again uh, give it to the uh, next uh, qualifying uh, company. No? The third telco is believed to focus on providing fixed line internet or Wi Fi use in residential houses and offices. The new telco will use the fiber optics owned by the government scattered throughout the country. The DICT says 
fixed-line internet users in the country is only 14%. That is why there is a big market waiting for the new telco player. As of now, there are only five companies who express interest to join the bidding process. It is expected that the new telco will be operational and will have their own subscribers in the middle of 2019. Mon Hock Son, UNTV News and Rescue, Quezon City. One of the five doctors from the Philippine Children's Medical Center who got infected with dengue has died. Meanwhile, dengue cases in the Philippines now reach over 100,000 based on the Department of Health's latest data. Aiko Miguel will tell us why in this exclusive report. The Department of Health confirms that a doctor at the Philippine Children's Medical Center died of severe dengue this Wednesday, weeks after the transmission. According to Undersecretary Eric Domingo, the pediatric surgery fellow was also diabetic, and although the PCMC was fully equipped, she was not spared from having dengue. Po yung mga pasyente, maraming may dengue doon, then the possibility of transmission tumataas at syempre mga doktor natin, mga ano yan, selflessly uh, serving talaga yan na kahit anong oras nandoon sila. Recently, itong buwan na ito, nagkaroon tayo ng limang kaso no, ng mga doctors mismo natin na nagkaroon din sila ng dengue even while taking extra precautions. As of now, the four other doctors who got infected with dengue had already fully recovered. The PCMC mourns for the terrible loss with the death of one of their fellows. Per the assessment of the PCMC, the vector mosquito carrying the dengue virus is within PCMC, so they are now taking extra measures. Last month, the PCMC recorded 214 cases admitted because of dengue. As of September, there are five new dengue cases recorded in the hospital, 92 for the month of September. Parang medyo nagkakasunod sa sila na parang may nagkaroon ng pattern na parang puro doctors, puro uh, trainees. So ang aming uh, assessment, mukhang doon sila sa isang area nag-work sa bandang outpatient department namin. Although we're looking also into their quarters kung saan nga probably yung pinanggagalingan ng lamok. You know naman, ang PCMC is an open building. So talagang tagustagutan siya sa mga, sa mga lamok na nagkikeri ng dengue. According to Undersecretary Eric Domingo, it is currently the peak season of dengue cases in the country, especially after the onslaught of a typhoon and the continuous rainfall in different parts of the country. DOH reminds the public to be extra careful and follow the 4 strategy of the DOH to prevent transmissions and dengue outbreak. The DOH says children aged 10 to 14 most likely get infected with dengue. The public should destroy mosquito breeding places like stagnant water in streets, old wheels, and even in clogged canals. Children should also be given light-colored long sleeves and pants, be given insect repellent or mosquito patch on their clothes. The public should also immediately seek medical attention when experiencing symptoms of dengue like fever, severe headache, joint and muscle pain, vomiting, skin rash, nose and gums bleeding and bruises. The public should also support selective fogging or fumigation of LGUs in areas with high dengue cases. We really just want to detect our patients very, very early. Sana lang uh, basta po magkaroon na ng symptoms, magkalagnat o tsaka masakit yung katawan, magpatingin na po sa ating mga center, sa RHU, or sa ating mga hospitals para po matest natin agad kung dengue ito o hindi. Based on the DOH data from January 1 to September 1, 2018, there are 100,225 listed dengue cases in the country. This is 6% higher compared to more than 94,000 dengue cases last 2017. The National Capital Region places third of the top five regions with highest dengue cases in the Philippines this 2018. Aiko Miguel, UNTV News and Rescue, Quezon City. Former Senate President Aquilino Nene Pimentel hits former Senator Juan Ponce Enrile for claiming that only one was executed and none were arrested for their political and religious beliefs under the martial law of former President Ferdinand Marcos. Enrile made these remarks in an interview that was published by former Senator Bongbo Marcos a day before the 46th martial law anniversary. Rosalie Cos tells us why. 
On the eve of the 46th anniversary of martial law declaration, former Senator Bongbong Marcos uploaded to his Facebook account his one-on-one -on -one interview with former Senate President Juan Ponce Enrile. The interview was about the martial law declaration of his father, former President Ferdinand Marcos. Enrile recalled the times under martial law, denying reports that thousands were killed and arrested back then. Enrile claims only one was executed under the martial law, and that is Chinese drug lord Lim Seng. Name me one person that was arrested because of political or religious belief during that period. None. They were all Name for criminal acts. Name me one acts. person that uh, was arrested simply because he criticized President Marcos. None. Jovi Salonga, for instance. Oh. He was involved in the Light of Fire movement and many others. There were very few were arrested and they were released. They were inconvenient, uh, inconvenience for a while, but they were released. He also said that Marcos was pushed to declare martial law because of alleged conspiracy between the Liberal Party and the Communist Party of the Philippines. The attempted ambush attack against Enrile in 1972 was one of the bases why martial law was declared by Marcos nationwide on September 22, 1972. He appointed Enrile as martial law administrator. But former Senate President Aquilino Pimentel Jr. hits Enrile's recollection of events, saying Manung Johnny must have forgotten about him. Pimentel says he was imprisoned four times during martial law because of his political beliefs. <laughs> Pimentel also points out that everyone has the right to express their opinion but reiterates that the public should not be influenced by the opinions of those who have hidden agenda. The former lawmaker also believes that the end does not justify the means and the edifices as well as the infrastructures built during Marcos' government cannot compensate the every life lost. The end never justifies the means. Otherwise, parati na lang mangyari that people will be deprived of their rights and freedom and liberties on the pretext that uh, this is for your good, for the good of the rest of the people. So we should resist that kind of an attempt. All the Rosa Licoz, UNTV News and Rescue, Malacanã. Meanwhile, Albay Representative Edsel Lagman tells how he and his family suffered during martial law under the Marcos administration, contradicting the statement of former Senator Juan Ponce Enrile. Grace Casin will tell us why. Ang sabi ay walang nakulong ng martial law. Hindi, wala lang ho nakulong. Maraming sapilitan duwi nala. This was the statement of Albay Representative Ed Salagman in the statement of former Senator Juan Ponce Enrile, saying no one was put in jail during martial law under the Marcos administration. Lagman recalled how his brother Hermon Lagman disappeared on May 11, 1977, who was then fighting against Marcos' dictatorship. He and his family never see his brother again. Who was the first lawyer to, dis to have uh, disappeared during martial law? Uh, we went to all camps looking for him and we were uh, told that he was not there but we knew that uh, he had been uh, apprehended by forces of the, mili of the military. Lawmaker said also one of his brother, Popoy Lagman Jr., was incarcerated during martial law. Lagman said despite of Marcus's effort to clean their name to the millennials or youth, they can never erase what was written in the history. There can be no revision of the atrocities of martial law. Lagman says he feels bad every time the Marcoses are trying to save their family from the human rights violations happened during their reign. More so because his own family had experienced such violation of human rights. I really feel more aggrieved and insulted by the very statements which would... Uh, negate what happened during martial law. Grace Cassin, UNTV News and Rescue, House of Representatives. Various anti-Duterte groups cried never again to martial law in line with its 46-year commemoration today. John Nano tells us why. 
Hundreds of protesters from various sectors joined the anti-martial rally in line with its 46th year of commemoration today. The groups who joined the rally were the Partidong Lakas ng Masa, Gabriela, Kadamay, ACT teachers, Partilis, students from different universities and some members of the Catholic Church. The protesters gathered earlier in USD España, then walked towards Menjola and moved until Luneta in Manila. Holding their placards and banners with words on it and martial law, the protesters again condemned the various cases of violence and human rights violation when former President Ferdinand Marcos declared martial law. They also shouted praises saying never again to martial law to denounce what they claim is a repeat of martial law under the leadership of President Rodrigo Duterte. This is due to the alleged rampant human rights violation cases, political persecution among the critics of the president and what they claim as curtailment of press freedom under the current administration. Nakikita natin ang sinyal, ano, the sign of the time and we do not wait just like sitting ducks. Ang sinasabi natin Magkaisa tayo na imarka natin na hindi natin tatanggapin ang batas militar. Never again, never again to martial law. Bayan Muna President Sator Ocampo also expressed his worries on the possible election of former Senator Bongbong Marcos as the next president if anything happens to President Duterte. Meanwhile, hundreds of police personnel were also deployed in the area to maintain peace and order in Luneta, as thousands of pro-Duterte groups also held the rally to counter the program of the anti-Duterte groups. Joan Nano, UNTV News and Rescue, Manila. A historian has expressed that it seems like the Filipinos have not learned from what happened during the time of martial law. Kathy Maglalang tells us why. Natuto na ba tayo pero binoboto pa rin natin yung mga taong walang kakayahan sa pamahalaan. Binoboto pa rin natin yung mga alam na natin na nagnanakaw. Uh, wala pa rin tayong pakialam sa iba. Yun yung magandang tanong eh na natuto na ba tayo? This is the statement of Jan Ray Ramos, a historian, about the declaration of martial law by then President Marcos 46 years ago. According to Ramos, it is important to commemorate the past to make the public be vigilant on preserving freedom and human rights and to cultivate deep commitment and care to fellow men. Maganda na napag-uusapan natin ito. Ayan. At yung mga bagong henerasyon, kahit na hindi nila naranasan yung, yung kasaysayan o yung nakaraan, tulad ko, isa akong batang historiador, uh, mahalaga na bumabalik tayo tapos na iko-connecta natin yung nakaraan sa kasalukuyan. Ramos explained that history has its power to the decisions being made today that will mold the future that depends on how we perceive the past. He adds that martial law is a reminder to be responsible to democracy and the welfare of everyone. Balikan lang natin yung constitution natin na nasa preamble na ang layunin natin, ang gusto natin bilang isang bayan ay bumuo ng isang pamahalaan na siyang mga ngalaga sa karapatan at demokrasya natin. Meanwhile, UNTV News and Rescue Team asked the public to pulse their knowledge about martial law. Mang Porferio, 70 years old, shared that he likes curfew during martial law regime. Yung mga pagpatay na wala sa lugar, yung papatay na lang na walang dahilan, yun ang din maganda rin. Ang pagkakaalam ko po kasi sa martial law, itiniklara po yun ni, ano, ni Pangulong Marcos na paghihigpit sa, ano, sa bansa natin. On the other hand, some of the Filipinos don't know about it. Hindi ko po alam eh. Hindi <laughs> ko alam. <laughs> Kathy Magdalang, UNTV News and Rescue, Pasay City. The Marawi City Police is keeping tight watch over 24 villages ahead of the special barangay and Sangguniang Kabataan elections set to be held tomorrow, September 22. Bernard Dadis tells us why. The Marawi City Police is strengthening its security measures for the conduct of special barangay and Sangguniang Kabataan elections on Saturday. A total of 1,000 police personnel will be deployed to voting precincts and other areas in the city to ensure that no election-related violence will occur on the day of the polls. The city police is also keeping tight watch over 24 of the 96 villages in the one torn city that are in the watch list of the Philippine National Police for intense political rivalry. Two villages 
Kabingan and Gadungan are also considered election hotspots due to previous poll-related violence. The nine-day campaign period has ended last September 20, and during this time, police say that only one was apprehended for violating the gun ban policy. Authorities hope that the rest of the election period will be orderly and peaceful. Sana ngayon na makapagbago na tayo dito sa Lanao del Sur, dito sa Marawi. Sana makatikim yung mga tao dito ng, ng peaceful na election. Though no threats to the special polls were monitored, security has been wrapped up following the recent blast in the parts of Mindanao. The Commission on Elections has earlier reported that at least 76,000 ballots were printed and distributed to 33 voting centers in Marawi City. Several voting centers were also established for the 24 barangays that were inside the ground zero and were totally ruined after the Marawi siege. Voting will start at 7 a.m. until 3 p.m. tomorrow. Bernard Dadis, UNTV News and Rescue, Philippines. The primary suspect in the September 16 blast in general.